You shuffle through the dank, dilapidated corridors of the USG Ishimura, fingers uneasily twitching on the trigger of your plasma cutter. Your cutter provides a little comfort, for its original purpose is far from a weapon. Instead, it was designed for mining operations. It's a reminder that you're no soldier. You're an engineer. You shouldn't be in this place. You shouldn't be fighting these things. The Necromorphs, creatures born out of the depths of hell, the deep space variety. Creatures with a singular purpose of spreading their demonic infection. Corpses of colleagues on the USG Ishimura, twisted and perverted into hosts hostile on anything with a pulse that isn't part of the collective. The bodies of your fellow men, perhaps some you may even know, seeking to rend you, limb from limb. A screech cries out, somewhere behind you, or maybe above you. It's hard to see in this place. It's hard to know where you're going in this place. In a rush of screeching metal, the necromorph appears. Your only chance at survival is a steady hand and a quick trigger. You raise the cutter. You are Isaac Clark, and this is Dead Space. Hey everyone, I'm Calvin Fisher, and I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer. I'm also a fan of games, especially third-person action games and shooters. As such, it's a wonder how I never got around to playing the Dead Space series. Its status as a science fiction horror game is legendary, after all. Don't get me wrong, it's a series I've always wanted to dive into, but I just never got around to it. With the remake coming in a few months, I thought it would be great to play through these classics. As someone who's about 10 years too late to the hype train, I figure I have a great perspective into how they hold up today. Here's a basic summary of the video. I'm going to break down each chapter of the game. At the end, I'll wrap up with some closing thoughts on the game. I'll leave chapter breaks so you can jump around to your heart's content. With all that said, let's kick it off with chapter 1. The game starts off with a video message left to us by a woman named Nicole. You'd think that in the far future she could have communicated to us with a video quality a bit better than your average VHS tape, but hey, I'm not one to judge. Anyway, her message is pretty vague. She tells us that she's sorry and that everything's falling apart, but that's all you have to go off of. It does a good job of piquing your interest by making you ask a lot of questions. Who is this woman? Why is she sorry? Why is everything falling apart? The bad screen quality, with my quibbles about technology regressing notwithstanding, does a good job of setting an eerie tone. The video recording cuts out and we're introduced to the game world. It's a rough start, and boy do I mean that literally. The screen shaking in this section is next level. It makes me think that Isaac cracked a few too many cold ones with the space bros and went on a hell of a bender before scraggling onto the ship. Thankfully, this shaking ends quickly and we're introduced to the game's main cast. Isaac Clark, the engineer and the game's protagonist. Computer specialist Kendra Daniels, and lastly, Chief Zach Hammond. Daniels starts by talking about the tape. Isaac is a non-voice protagonist. This is a common trope in shooters. Having a non-voice protagonist allows a player to more easily imprint themselves into the main character. The thing is, though, that the trope is generally reserved for first-person shooters or games with a user-created character. It feels weird having this defined guy named Isaac remain silent as a stone as Daniels asks some questions. Fortunately, this gets a little less awkward throughout the rest of the game. It's worse here because first, she's talking about his personal life, reminding you that he is, in fact, a person, but he's just not responding. Also, he isn't wearing his mask. Once he puts the old bucket on, it's a lot easier to forget that he has a mouth behind it. She and Hammond fill you in on some backstory. Space mining is a lucrative business and you're on your way to the USG Ishimura. The USG Ishimura is a planet cracker. Planet cracking is a new way of mining planets. You're on your way to investigate a distress signal sent by the ship. Pretty soon you learn the lights are out and it sure as hell doesn't seem like anybody's home. You discover a busted communications array and Hammond decides to send you and Daniels to fix it. Don't you just feel like a lucky guy? It's not long before things that get turned for the worst. You come in for a bumpy landing and pretty soon your own ship is in need of repairs. The party decides to forge on in spite of that. You're given control of Isaac and the adventure is on. The introduction doesn't waste much time providing backstory for Daniels or Hammond, nor much reason to like or remember them. They're here for the mission and that's emblematic of their role throughout the rest of the story. They're here to keep you on track and focus and keep the main mission in line. They help immerse you in the world, but they aren't people you'd be too hasty to grab a beer with afterwards. You enter the ship and turn on an assessment report. The the situation nosedives as you're locked in the situation report room and the hazard lights go on. We get our first encounter with the enemy, the Necromorphs. This is a great scene. Other developers may have made this introduction a cutscene, but the developers of Dead Space made a sound decision to keep the player in control of Isaac. As the chaos unfolds and the Necromorphs rend your crewmates limb from limb, you have a sense of helplessness. 
trapped behind the glass as you are. However, by still having control, the player doesn't feel at all safe. The power to move means you might be forced to move. At any second, one of those abominations could drop out of the ceiling grate and try to get you. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. You race through the hallways with absolutely no way to defend yourself, barely squeezing into an elevator. In short order, you're introduced to the plasma cutter, Isaac's first weapon and most iconic. It's a tool for engineering turned into a tool of survival. I think the quick appearance of a way to defeat the necromorph speaks to the larger overall design philosophy of Dead Space. You're meant to feel vulnerable always, but rarely helpless. You're responsible for getting yourself out of this grisly situation, one well-placed blast at a time. We fight our first necromorph and handle him in short order. We're introduced next to another crucial tool in Isaac's arsenal, stasis. This ability allows Isaac to freeze things or life forms in place for a limited amount of time. It has limited use and is replenished by consumable items or the occasional recharge station. Stasis is the perfect safety net for when things get too out of hand. You can put a quick pause on combat and take careful shots, or you can reposition. Stasis will also be a crucial element of the puzzles throughout the game. We journey on to repair the broken tram system, cutting up necromorphs along our way. The game starts off at a breakneck pace, confident in introducing new game mechanics as soon as the player gets a hold of the last. The number of necromorphs we encounter increases at a steady clip. In Chapter 1, we're already introduced to another enemy type, these flaily guys that the wiki calls leapers. Most games start their first chapters off with just basic enemy types, so I appreciate the game's confidence and players being able to handle a challenge. We're also introduced to the upgrade system. Right away, it becomes clear that this system isn't going to be the most riveting upgrade system that's ever been devised. No new abilities or uses come about for any of the weapons. Instead, there are just base upgrades to traits like damage, capacity, and reload. Still, because Dead Space is a horror game where resources are limited, yet the opposition is still immense, these upgrades are always appreciated and the system works better than most. In other games, one point of upgrade damage means little to me, but in Dead Space it may mean one less shot to take down a necromorph, which means I can spare that shot for another enemy. Once a tram system is fixed, we listen to Daniels and Hammond bicker. The quarantine system lifts, so Hammond orders Isaac to prepare our arrival ship for launch. He and Daniels plan on finding out what they can, and then joining you to leave this place. I appreciate that these people do in fact seem to have a survival instinct, something that distinctly seems to lack in a lot of other horror media. So we go back to the launch ship and uh, we, we try our very best. With our launch ship in disrepair, we have no choice but to find another way out. We need the captain's authorization codes on his rig, so we get ourselves a fresh new suit, hop onto the tram station, and wrap up chapter one. Chapter two starts with Isaac stepping off the tram. We're gonna get pretty used to this sight, as almost every chapter is bookended by Isaac getting on and off the tram. We're greeted by a strange woman wearing a bandage around her eyes, petting a dismembered corpse and babbling incoherently. For some reason, I remember feeling really bad for her. She draws more sympathy from me than almost any other character in the game, and I'm not quite sure why, because she's just a throwaway character that only appears here. Maybe it's the voice acting, which is really well done. The way she sobs is just really good at pulling that primal emotion out of you. Maybe it's also the sad way she drops the kinesis module. Anyway, the sign that I felt emotion from this one appearance character is a testament to how well it's done. Until you pick up the kinesis module. This doohickey kind of evaporates all the emotion I had felt up till this point. You get a big notification with the tutorial as this woman is checking out of existence just a couple feet in front of you. Then when she does check out, her body ragdolls in a really bizarre way. The kinesis module lets you pick stuff up and throw it around. It's useful for puzzles as well as in combat encounters to throw things at the necromorphs. You can even throw their own pinchers back at them. Well, as I'm playing around with the module, picking stuff up and throwing it around, I get a dark curiosity. I wonder if the kinesis can be used on the blindfolded woman. Sure enough, it can. And here is where I learned that the kinesis module is a great addition to the sandbox, but it can be a bit immersion breaking in certain situations if you let yourself get carried away. It's also at this point in the game, I'm really starting to appreciate just how good it looks. It's from 2008, but it holds up incredibly well today, easily looking like it could be four or five years newer. The lighting? character models, and animations are all fantastic. As a testament to how good this game looks, my wife saw me playing and asked if I was playing the remake. She plays games herself and isn't ignorant of how graphics looks today, so the fact that she asked such a question I think speaks volumes. With our stasis ability in hand, we continue to find the captain's ring. I find a schematic for the flamethrower and I know what my next mission is. Scrape together the credits to acquire it. I've always been a big fan of flamethrowers in games. Something about spraying a swath of flames around tickles the lizard part of my brain. 
We will learn that Hammond and Daniels were attacked, and they were separated from each other. Hammond is still keen on finding the captain's rig for the codes, but we need to get Thermate and shock pads first. So I add them to the shopping list and we press on. We fight some more necromorphs. I try to offer one some pills, but he wasn't very receptive. More of an ibuprofen type of guy. We get to use the Kinesis ability for something we'll do pretty often throughout the game, placing batteries into sockets. It's a very satisfying experience, and it just feels very good in a tactile sense. That's one thing about the Kinesis ability. The game does a great job of making sure that whenever you use it for a puzzle or other interaction, it feels great. We enter our first vacuum. All the air is sucked out, so Isaac has a limited amount of air time before he chokes out. This timer is displayed right above Isaac's health pack. These sections are great at ratcheting up tension, as Isaac has to fight a time limit as well as the Necromorphs. The suffocating sound Isaac makes is so damn creepy too. The choking sound starts so early too, which amounts to the fact that Isaac sounds like he's choking on a goat for almost the entire duration you're in one of these sections. We exit the vacuum quickly and are introduced to another type of environment, zero gravity, where, you guessed it, there's zero gravity. The zero gravity and vacuum environments are sometimes together, sometimes separate. Think of them like a Venn diagram. On one side you have vacuum environments, which can be standalone, and on the other you have zero G environments. Sometimes they're together, in the center, and other times they're apart. Anyway, the zero G environments I'm not a very big fan of. You still move on the ground, but with the ability to jump by aiming at another wall and hitting Y. The camera is the worst culprit. Whenever you jump towards a new surface and land on it, the camera always seems to freak out before rapidly pivoting to face whatever direction Isaac is facing. It's disorienting, especially when combat starts. In addition, when you're fighting enemies, if you want to jump somewhere else, to escape, you have to turn away from the threat, aim, and jump. You always have to lose track and rapidly try to find the enemy again when you relocate. With the aforementioned camera freakout, it makes for a janky experience to say the least. I won't belabor the point, but just to say that the zero G sections are some of my least favorite in the game, and they happen a bit too often for my liking. We get our shock pad and backtrack. I like how the game introduces you to enemies as you backtrack. You get used to the environment and the mechanics along the way, and then get to use them with the added challenge of combat on the way back, when you've already familiarized yourself with the environments. It lets you focus on learning one thing at a time and is a clever bit of game design. Backtracking is also a bit less tedious with the added challenge. We're introduced to a new enemy, these creepy crawly things. They elevate straight to the top of my don't touch the merchandise list. They do such a ridiculous amount of damage when they latch onto you. They're small so they're hard to hit and they always come in big packs. Almost like a flamethrower would be perfect for them, but I'm still too broke to get my pride and joy. We continue on and battle through a quarantine zone. I pick up an audio tape and I learn that these aren't always placed in a safe area. I have to blast away a necromorph as I listen to the recording. It made me chuckle thinking of Isaac popping in a podcast as he's fighting these guys. Imagine him just throwing on a Joe Rogan podcast and going to town. We watch behind glasses and other enemies introduced. These guys with three tentacles that huck shards at you. If you recall, this part uses a similar storytelling technique as the introduction. We have control of Isaac but have to watch a scene play out behind glass. We get our hands on the thermite and are ready to blast our way into the clinic to get our hand on the captain's rigs. We continue on to get a recording from Nicole, essentially letting us know that the situation was spiraling out of control as more and more people got infected. More audio podcasts are scattered throughout the level. The quality of these is really high, with the voice acting of these background characters more impressive than some main characters in other big budget games. You can tell a lot of time and care went into each and every one of them. It's really impressive, and they add greatly to the game's atmosphere. I mean, listen to this one. I know undergoing a transformation into something extraordinary. I must know more. Even as the believer within me wants to become one of them, the scientist needs to uncover their secrets. I need to study one of these necromorphs, as Kind so clinically puts it. I need to witness this infection firsthand. Perhaps that patient from the coma. Or this one. Hello? Can anybody hear me? My name is Eileen Fisk. I just woke up in here and everybody was gone. I don't know what's happening. Why do they all leave? I'm going to try and find someone. If you can hear this, please come for me. I can hear scratching in the wall. Hello? Who's there? Are, are you a doctor? Why is everyone... Wait, I know you. In the latter clip, we're listening to the audio as this woman is creepily going at this dead body with a hacksaw before taking it to her own throat. It's creepy enough, but the audio log in the background, it's even more amplified. It's a great example of how the various elements of the game play well off of each other to create the immersive atmosphere. We get to the morgue and we find the captain's remains getting feasted on by a new winged necromorph. The captain has turned into a new type of necromorph, a darker, meaner variety of the typical slasher. Again, this chapter has introduced multiple enemy types, complicating the game sandbox rapidly. The developers have a lot of confidence in throwing new tools, enemies, and scenarios at your feet, and leaving it up to you on how to handle them. It makes for an engaging, ever-evolving experience. 
The sandbox's increasing complexity and danger also underscore the story. The rapidly evolving sandbox underscores how Isaac is plunging deeper and deeper into the USG Ishimura, and the rapid increase helps highlight just how dangerous this ship is. It's another example of how well Dead Space's gameplay and story elements play together to provide that sense of immersion. We defeat the former captain, acquire his rig, and mosey on back to the tram station. We're on our way to chapter 3. We step off the tram and are met by a host of problems. Hammond lets us know that the ship is out of fuel and that the gravity centrifuge is offline. That means the ship's being pulled down. That's not good, so we need to rectify both problems. It's at this point I've started noticing a pattern with the missions. Most of the time when Hammond and Daniels get on the comms is merely to order you around and tell you to fix something. It gets the job done in getting Isaac on his quest, I guess, but I feel myself wanting a little bit more. Having Hammond and Daniels primarily there to bark orders at you doesn't exactly inculcate feelings of love and affection towards them. It has the same effect as if your boss continuously commands you to do this or that. Which, I mean, they are Isaac's bosses, so points for immersion, I guess. It just makes me wish some of these mission objectives had a little bit more context to them. Like maybe we could see the centrifuge blow out of a window, and then we could see the ship hurtling down towards the planet. Then, when Hammond says we need to go fix it, we as the player really see why that needs to happen and are more motivated to actually go and do it. it. Feels like a little more context for some of these missions rather than just being told what to do by a talking head could go a long way. My first stop on this mission is this door. I finally have enough credits to get my chair's flamethrower. It looks like a glorified DEET sprayer, hastily strapped to a lighter. I love it. It's another reminder of how Isaac's scrounging together this stuff with good old gumption and a little engineering know-how. I have 100 points of fuel for it. Sounds like a lot, so I plunge ahead, eager to test my wares against the first Pinterest stuff of life form I come across. I take down my first necromorph only to find out that 100 fuel points is not that much. I use about half my ammo on one necromorph. It will tinge a disappointment as I realize this thing is going to be a bit more limited use than I initially thought. It feels really good to use though and can keep necromorphs at bay while the flames are spraying. It's a great tool to use when faced with multiple enemies especially the smaller ones. All in all it's a useful addition to my arsenal. I'm going to get every inch of mileage I can out of this bad boy. We weave our way through the dark corridors and eventually switch on the fueling sequence. With some fuel in the tank, we're ready to get the engines online and restore orbit to the ship. It's high time I plot one of the most highly praised elements of Dead Space, the user interface. This is something that people have made countless videos about, so I don't want to tread old ground. In a nutshell, the UI is minimalistic while still being clear and providing all the necessary information. I think where I can add a new perspective is by shedding some insight into why this is so difficult to achieve. I'm a software engineer with a focus in front-end UI, so designing UIs is something I'm a little more than familiar with. The reason why it's so hard to nail a UI is because the various goals can clash with one another. A good UI strives to be a few things. First, a good UI should look good. This generally means more minimalist. The less you have on the screen is generally the better. Nobody likes to open something and be assaulted by a thousand buttons and knobs. However, a UI should also be powerful, giving the user all the tools they need to let them perform the tasks they have to. In Dead Space's case, the player needs to quickly identify all of the relevant game states and statuses. Things like the health bar, stasis level and ammo levels, but also things like waypoints of where the user needs to go. These two goals, looking good and being powerful, often conflict with one another. For a UI to be more powerful, it often means having to put more stuff into it, which harms how it looks, causing clutter which harms discoverability and just generally can look bad. For a UI to be minimal, it means having to cut down on what is shown and therefore run the risk of taking away functionality that the player needs, or hiding it in a place that isn't easily discoverable. As such, finding the perfect balance with between the two is incredibly difficult. So the fact that Dead Space conveys all the information that the player needs, while also remaining minimal to the point of showing nothing on the screen that isn't actually in the game world, is nothing short of remarkable. But enough about that. We venture forward to discover this big hole in the wall. I later learned this is a nice piece of foreshadowing for an enemy that we will discover later. We're introduced to another zero gravity section. I don't exactly love this one, but I don't hate it either. The area is wide and spacious with few walls so you don't get too disoriented. Playing the centrifuges together is also a satisfying experience. With the centrifuge back online, gravity returns, but we're running out of air. It's a vacuum situation now. Remember that Venn diagram I was talking about earlier. We have to dodge the swinging centrifuge arms as we make our way to the exit. The section of the game is really well designed. The centrifuge spinning means that you have to duck into safe zones whenever the arm draws near. These safe zones aren't really that safe though, as necromorphs often camp out in them. This forces you to stay all nice and cuddly with the necromorphs, which adds tension. In addition, the constant loss of oxygen means that you can't 
or skiing in one place for too long, otherwise you'll run out of air. These factors combine to make for a tense combat encounter that feels unique to the others we've seen in the game up till this point. Safety doesn't await us when we exit the area. Remember that bit of foreshadowing I mentioned earlier? Well, consider the foreshadowed, as we're grabbed by this tentacle thing, which we desperately have to shoot out. Daniels returns. We'll learn that she's alive and well. She's done some digging around, and learned that the colonists were experiencing widespread dementia due to an artifact discovered called the Maker. We're left to ruminate on this little tidbit for now as we continue on. I pick up an assault rifle, a rapid fire tool good for when you're overrun by necromorphs. The final encounter of this level is a significant difficulty spike compared to the prior encounters in the game. Feels like the game is throwing everything it has so far at you, while also introducing a new enemy type. I didn't learn until later that you're not supposed to shoot these bloated guys in the stomach, or you have to contend with a heap of the smaller spider guys, which probably made this section significantly harder for me. With the coast thoroughly cleared, we reignite the engine. Once the engine is re-engaged, the screen shakes like wild. This just goes to show that nothing is perfect, not even Dead Space's UI. If you try to open the menu, it shakes like it owes a mobster money. I don't know why the menu has to shake like that. Either keep it still or don't even let the player access it in the first place. All in all, the combat section is a sound end to the chapter, and one that tells you things are only going to get tougher from here on out. The chapter starts with Hammond and Daniels arguing about the Maker. Daniels accuses Hammond, saying he knew about the artifact. He denies it. We've got to help get the ship's asteroid defenses in order, as the ship is in risk of getting pelted by asteroids. We get to this general lobbyish area. I really like the look of the place. It's a great visual break from what we've primarily experienced so far. Instead of being cramped in hallways, this area is wide. It also has a cool blue-gray color scheme, and we get a good look at the space outside of the ship. Swiftly, the ship is pelted by a meteor. We can see outside that meteors are raining down. This is the exact type of mission context I was asking for earlier. We can see with our own eyes that the ship is in danger of getting bombarded, and we see the imperative need to fix the ADS system ourselves. We descend to find Hammond. He gives us more details on our mission. We need to reroute power to the ADS system via junction boxes. See, this deep briefing is a lot better than the prior chapters. Hammond is here in person. You get the feeling that he's doing work too, exploring the ship like us. He's more than a talking head here. He concludes by telling us he saw something big out there. That's not great news. That means we're going to have to fight it. I sure don't see Hammond strapping on an AK and storming the decks. Sure enough, we ascend back to the main deck and are faced with this rhinoceros-type enemy. He charges at you. It's your job to get out of the way and fire at the weak points in his shoulders. His intimidating design is lessened somewhat by the fact that he just bumps into you if he runs into you. It just doesn't look that intimidating, although it takes a large amount of your health away. This guy doesn't have any projectiles, so it's mostly a matter of staying clear of him and putting shots into his weak points. In the elevator, we pick up a video log and discover there is a mutiny on the ship sent around the handling of the Maker. The captain was deposed. I continue on and this happened. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be winning an IQ contest anytime soon. We face half against another Rhino. This data room has a lot more cramped confines than the prior conflict. It's a reminder of how Dead Space has excellent diversity in its combat scenarios by smartly mixing up both the enemy variety as well as the arena design. We return to the main deck and run into some very unwelcome visitors. We show them the door. We delve deeper into the ship, fighting off the Necromorphs, and get the ADS system back on. But uh-oh, there's a problem. Who would have guessed? The automatic targeting is down, so we have to do some blasting ourselves until Hammond can fix it. We get to the top of the ship and have another zero-g section to face. This so far is my least favorite section of the game. You essentially have to play an R-rated version of Frogger, hiding behind these machines when asteroids pass by. I've got a number of problems with it. First, the indication of when the asteroids is coming is not very clear. There is some flare-up of wind, but it's hard to tell when the asteroids have passed, or when they are starting to the point that you won't cross safely. Eventually I got the hang of the timing, but I endured a couple frustrating deaths because of this. Second, the zero gravity part of this is the most clunky we've seen yet. The ground curves upward. I couldn't jump from machine to machine with the zero G jump. Maybe you can, but I couldn't get it to work after numerous attempts, so it's slipshod at best. The best you can use the zero G for is jumping further ahead on the ground, but this too is a weird looking, weird feeling experience. On top of that, it's a little boring. Waiting behind these things, squinting at the screen to judge these little wind flares isn't exactly a cerebral experience but we eventually make it to the end and do some asteroid blasting. The goal of this minigame is to blast all of the asteroids. If too many make it to the ship and the whole integrity reaches zero, it's game over. 
The mechanics of shooting are kind of weird. It's hard to explain, but the way that the turret moves with your controller is odd, especially as you near the edges of the visible area. It's got almost a fishbowl effect, where it seems to accelerate the further from the center you get. And you'll have to aim for the corners a lot. The asteroids love flying there, so you'll be feeling this a lot. Still, blowing up asteroids is kind of fun, and it's forgiving. For that, I can overlook most of its faults. I did a lot worse of a job than I should have, letting a ton of asteroids through, but I still passed the first try. It's also short, so it doesn't overstay its welcome. I also like how the turret area remains in the hell state that you finish at. Since I almost lost the ship, the area is still smoking and in flames. It's a nice attention to detail. With that complete, we mosey our way back to the tram. In the zero-g area, we don't have asteroids to contend with, Instead, some necromorphs decided to join the party. Then we hop onto the tram and kiss chapter four goodbye. The ship's air is contaminated due to a necromorph and it's getting worse. We've got to put a stop to it. The first step is collecting some chemicals. So let's trudge through some dang corridors and get the job done. We encounter a new enemy, a red humanoid necromorph with tentacles protruding from it. Hmm, I'm sensing some copyright infringement. Anyway, these diet doc ox mainly attack you by birthing these little sack creatures with tentacle appendages, and they're the main ones to shoot you. Man, that sounds really bizarre when I say it. Continuing on, the wiki calls these guys guardians, and they do exactly that. They're stuck to walls, and good luck passing by them unless you take them out. You have to shoot out all their tentacles to kill them, while also contending with the little sacks they give birth to. If you let them spawn too many sacks, you're going to be facing a barrage of blasts that will shrink your health like a dress shirt tossed into the dry cleaner. These guys are okay. They're not offensively bad, but they're not very fun to fight. They grind your progress to a standstill and feel more like an exercise of tedium than anything else. But I commend the game for still throwing new challenges at us. I'm glad we're not just fighting one necromorph type all the way through. We get our hands on the antigen we need, only for this guy to roll up on the scene, Dr. Chalice Mercer. He's our main antagonist for this point of the game. He's a zealot of the Church of Unitology. He gets right down to business, explaining that the necromorph infection is the next stage of human evolution and part of God's plan. It's all mustache twirling stuff, with Mercer giving the whole resistance is futile stuff. He's such a heavy handed bad guy that it's hard to take what he says seriously, or find him super compelling. The game's definitely not trying to do either of those things, but still. Some of the lore on the Church of Unitology you get later in the game is some pretty interesting stuff. It would have been cool to get a bit more interesting of a perspective from the main in-game character used for this faction. He's not a bad villain, but he makes me wish for a bit more. However, it's not something I think the game has a lot of time for. Spending more time fleshing this guy out would have likely required diversions from other focuses of the game. Game development is a give and take after all. Once Mercer finishes his speech, he opens the container behind you, revealing a new type of necromorph, the Hunter. The Hunter is one of his experiments, combining a living human with the necromorph infection. The results, let's say, aren't great for us. The Hunter can regenerate itself at astounding rates, meaning that our weapons are ineffective at killing it. This means as of now, our only option is to run. The Hunter appears at a great time in the game. You're really starting to feel on top of things, acquiring and upgrading new guns and building out your armor. This, along with your natural improvement at the game's mechanics, make you start to feel like you can handle this whole necromorph thing. The Hunter takes that false sense of security and rips it right out from under you. It gives you that same feeling of vulnerability that you had during Chapter 1. You run into Mercer again, and he lets you know that Isaac's death won't be in vain. Thanks Dr. Mercer, I feel a whole lot better now. We get a combat encounter with more necromorphs. The hunter's presence throws a big wrench into things, as you have to evade him while also battling the other necromorphs. It's a great example, again, of how Dead Space masterfully combines the enemy types and environments together to make every combat encounter feel unique. I hardly feel like any fight in the game is filler. It goes to show how great Dead Space's enemy design and level design are, with, maybe, the exception of the next Guardian encounter. I can't bring myself to enjoy fighting these guys. We get to Dr. Mercer's creepy little lab, where we find an audio tape of his findings. The guy does manage to be off-putting, I'll give him that. We mix our batch, and we synthesize the poison we'll need to kill the necromorph that is infected the ship. Dr. Mercer interrupts our call Daniels to tell us to accept our own extinction. It's clear that the art of persuasion isn't among Dr. Mercer's talents. He vents out all of the air, and we're going to suffocate if we don't bring it back online. I found this section pretty difficult actually, dying a few times before clearing it out. I kept running out of time. Then, I tried to ignore the necromorphs and race through. That didn't work either. I actually had to employ <gasps> strategy in order to get past this part using the game's mechanics. Especially stasis to freeze the spider creatures, which let me then run past them unharmed. It also helped that I yeeted for the exit as the cutscenes were still playing, which bought me extra time. 
We get into this chamber, and Dr. Mercer spends some time lording over us about how he's going to save the species. He sure has a funny way of showing it, I'll say that. Then, the hunter lands right on top of me and the battle is on. We have to contain or defeat the hunter to progress. Our guns won't do it, so we need to find another way. The solution is fairly simple, and I figured it out pretty quickly, but I still appreciated it. You have to trap the hunter in the center area by using stasis on him. Then run to the computer that Dr. Mercer stood over and lock him inside. It's a butt-clenching run after you freeze him, as you hope you can make it in time before he unfreezes and hounds on you again. Overall, it's a great end of the chapter. With that, we hop onto the train and look to kill the contaminant. We step off the tram. This time, we don't get a debrief by Daniels or Hammond. We know what we're here to do. Poison the necromorph that's contaminating the ship. In pretty short order, we run into Hammond, who is contaminated by the bad air. It makes me wonder why Isaac is the only one with a cool armored suit, while Hammond and Daniels are given chump change. There's probably an in-universe lore reason for it. Still, when Hammond is choking on the air and telling me don't take off your mask, I can't help but wonder, dude, why don't you have one? He lets us know that there are poison-producing necromorphs in the next area. Essentially, they're working as a poison factory. We've got to take them down before hunting down the Leviathan. We continue into the greenhouse. I like how we're taken to various parts of the USG Ishimura. I think being taken to the food production area makes the ship feel a lot more real. I mean, people have to eat, right? And the question of how they get their food on the ship is answered by being taken through the greenhouse. It's a great way of using environmental storytelling to answer the player's questions without overwhelming them with the mountain of exposition. The greenhouse makes a sound combat area. It's open but composed of corridors created by the greenhouses dotted throughout. It forces you to keep moving. You can weave through and make space between yourself and the necromorphs. At the same time, the narrowness of the corridors means that if you aren't careful, you can end up trapping yourself. With the threat taken care of, we hunt down our first poison pod. They're sad, dopey creatures that don't present a threat aside from the poison they produce. I appreciate the attention to detail when you approach one of these guys. Your air system turns on just like it does when you enter a space vacuum. In addition, your flamethrower doesn't work. There isn't any usable oxygen since the place is so flooded with gas. These little details add up in immersing you in the world. We go on a scavenger hunt, scouring the greenhouse room and the appending rooms to find all of the poison pods. The interconnected nature of it all, again, serves to make the ship feel more real. Seeing the same environments multiple times reinforces their existence to the player. If each level was merely a corridor, where you are always moving forward without going back, the USG Ishimura would not imprint itself nearly as much in the player's head. Once all the pods are taken care of, we're free to take on the Leviathan, the primary contaminant. The Leviathan is a tritentacle monstrosity that you face down in a zero-g room. Yes, zero-g, my favorite mechanic. The goal here is pretty straightforward. Shoot at the weak points on the tentacles without getting blasted out by the tentacle arm. The fight does use zero-g fairly well for how meager the base mechanic is. The zero-g provides Isaac the mobility he needs to avoid the tentacles more wide sweeping attack. The issue is that when you land on another wall, the camera takes a while to relocate which is a disorienting experience. Fortunately, the tentacles don't attack super frequently, so you aren't generally at risk of getting slapped after you jump to avoid a tentacle blast. After the arms are neutralized, the core is exposed. The core lobs these explosive sacks at you, which you can pick up with your kinetic module and lob back. It's a good alternative to shooting if you're low on ammo. Health and ammo packs are scattered throughout the level, so it's forgiving at the very least. Eventually, tentacles appear again, so you have to contend with them along with the projectile spewing core. Despite a couple of missteps, we take down the Leviathan. Overall, it's a decent boss, albeit a bit clunky. I feel like, generally, every time I got hit, it actually was my fault, which is a good marker for a boss fight. The fight built on itself, by using the tentacles, then the core, then putting them together in the final phase. With the Leviathan taking the deep space equivalent of a dirt nap, and the ship's air supply no longer contaminated, we're free to plunge deeper into the void. We open chapter 7 with a debrief by Daniels. Our objective is to plant an SOS beacon on an asteroid that had otherwise been designated for smelting, and blast it out into space. There, it can send out a clear signal and hopefully get some help sent our way. After the last chapter, continuing with a big rock sounds a hell of a lot better than trading punches with a giant tentacle monster. So, I get moving. Our first step is to grab the SOS beacon. When we hop into this elevator, I learn exactly why the map and inventory are in-game menus, not pause menus. I think that jump scare took about two years of life out of me. After this incident, we reach another zero gravity field. This is actually one of my favorite zero-g areas throughout the game. The walls give us ample space to jump around and avoid the scorpions without the curvature seen in other sections which tend to make the camera go haywire. Our task here is to launch all of the asteroids into the force beam in the middle of the room. What can I say, it just feels satisfying to pick up hunks of rocks and huck them into a jet beam. We battle through some more necromorphs, reaching a gap with a conveniently placed conveyor belt to shuttle us to the other end. We need to fight off necromorphs as the conveyor belt moves. 
Luckily, there are blast canisters all around, which we can use to conserve ammo. At the end, we meet Nicole, Isaac's girlfriend, the woman from the initial message at the very beginning of the game. It's not at all bizarre or suspicious that she's camped out here, alone, amidst all of these necromorphs around, but whatever. Let's not ponder that for now. She says she can help us, and right now, I'm happy to take all the help I can get. She can disable the lock to the SOS beacon for us. We just have to protect her as the necromorphs come hounding in. Yeah, this guy scared me. I'll give you that one, Dead Space. Nicole is remarkably sanguine about the whole experience, not even shrieking once from what I can tell. Even when I was, uh, less than diligent about keeping her safe. If it was me at the terminal, I wouldn't be as quiet as a church nun, I can tell you that much. Also, I didn't notice this until going over my recordings, but the rig on her spine communicates how much health she has left, just like Isaac. This is another brilliant use of UI, able to communicate information to the player while remaining consistent in-world. With the SOS beacon in hand, we're ready to go to the asteroid. Well, I guess not. So, this area is a bit of a puzzle on how we can disengage the gravity system on the asteroid and plant the beacon. I figure out we need to use stasis on the generators, then shoot out their internals. So, I do that for two of the generators, but the gravity mechanism is still spinning. Then I look at my map. There are two more generators. I scour the room, but these elusive generators are nowhere to be found. I think I may have missed them earlier, so I do some searching. No dice. After about 20 minutes of searching, I decide that's about an adequate amount of my life to waste on a video game puzzle, so I look up the answer. Turns out, you're actually supposed to watch for the gravity arms to move and create an opening. Then, you can jump onto the asteroid, run along the exterior, and slip through the opening to deep space. Two more generators are waiting there. You destroy them, the same way as the interior generators, and plant the beacon on the surface. I don't like this puzzle for a number of reasons. The main reason is because I don't think it communicates very well with the player. If you touch the asteroid at the wrong time, it's instant death and you're sent back to the checkpoint. Then you need to clear the area of enemies again. This deters the player from trying to jump onto the asteroid. As I was trying to figure out the solution, I had considered whether I did in fact need to jump on the asteroid, only to remember my instant death experiences, which made me reticent to try again. I didn't want to lose the progress I had made. I was very close to figuring out the solution, but I didn't want to try it out. Instead of killing the player when they do something close to what they're supposed to do, say, jumping on the asteroid, but in a different spot, and rewarding that with an insta-kill will make them seek other solutions. This punishment for experimentation is worsened by the fact that the solution is not all that intuitive anyway. Yeah, I know it's a puzzle, so it's not supposed to be straightforward. It all just feels like a weird difficulty spike in the puzzles that we haven't had up until now. Then again, I'm someone with very little patience and a low tolerance for puzzles in games that aren't centered around them. I've never played an action game like Dead Space and said, you know what my favorite part of that game was? The puzzle on level 7. That's just me though. If you dig puzzles more than me, your mileage may vary. With the asteroid free, we're clear to reach the control room and launch it into space. In the meantime, I try to be a good Samaritan to the crew. I offer one a cup of coffee and help another into his chair. I think he mentioned something about bad posture. Anyway, neither were too grateful. That'll teach me to be helpful again. With the asteroid launched, Isaac gets some new digs and we shuffle back into the shuttle. At the start of chapter 8, Daniels gives us some good news, bad news. The good? Another ship picked up on our distress signal. The bad? The comms ray is busted, and we won't be able to communicate with them until that's sorted out. Stay back, Xfinity, there's a new player in town. We arrive at another observatory area that looks pretty similar to the one where we face the first rhino in the game. We face off against these necromorphs with bloated sacks attached to their arms. If they get too close to you, they'll kamikaze you, blowing both of you up. They're pretty easy to beat, and you can prematurely blow up their exploding sacks to take out other necromorphs. The tricky part is always making sure you're keeping track of your surroundings, and making sure one of these guys doesn't sneak up on you. We continue delving into the depths to get to the comms array. Then we see a soul in need. I hope nothing happens to this guy. A new necromorph appears. He's definitely the scariest looking out of the ones we've seen so far. Not the most threatening combat-wise though, as he shambles towards you. I don't get a chance to see what he's capable of, as I make liberal use of the flamethrower. Once he's taken care of, we continue on and find an upgrade bench. I think the worst part of the upgrade system is the blank nodes. Between actual upgrades, you have to expend your power nodes on blank modules that do absolutely nothing. I feel like I explored the game relatively more than the average player, and these things still don't come by like candy. So, it feels bad to use one and get nothing in return. I get that this decision was likely made for balancing reasons. The developers didn't want you to upgrade your plasma cutter to beast mode status by chapter 2. And yet, I feel like a better way to handle this would have just been to make some of the upgrades cost two nodes. It would have the same effect, but I feel like it would feel better than using one node on absolutely nothing. We continue our journey to the comms array. Along the way, I pick up another audio log. I'm reminded of just how good the audio tapes are. The voice acting is top notch. After a little tram ride, we arrive at our destination. 
The comma rays are looking a little worse for wear, so we need to reposition them to get a signal. It's another 0G area, but I think this is another one of my favorites. The comms area is wide and expansive, giving you plenty of areas to jump to. In addition, the fact that each plane is flat, yet generally angled from one another, means jumping from one spot to another is less discombobulating. The camera isn't freaking out from a curved surface or from an extreme angle switch. The puzzle part of this area is simple enough. In fact, the log tells you exactly what you need to do. Rearrange the working dishes in the innermost circle of the grid. Replacing the satellites is really satisfying. The good satellites magnetically slot into position in a satisfying way, and you can banish the bad satellites into the nether realm with the kinetic module. With the comms fixed, we get in contact with our rescuers. Only, we realize that the escape pod that Hammond jettisons at the beginning of the game is headed to their ship. We need to warm them, but the signal isn't good enough. There's something organic on the outside of the ship above the comms array, blocking the signal. We need to go and blast it away. We hop into the turret and get to blasting a necromorph tentacle monster. The objective is clear. Shoot the weak points of the tentacles will destroy any debris that the monster sends our way. This turret section is an improvement on the first. It takes the mechanics of that first go around, shooting incoming objects, and pairs them with an offensive objective. As such, it does a great job of building on prior mechanics and presenting you with a more complex yet still familiar challenge. The turret controls are still janky however, and that is punctuated by the accuracy needed to hit sporadic thrashing targets like the tentacle's weak points. Daniels tries to warn the rescue ship not to open the escape pod. Unfortunately, it appears that we are too late. The ship comes flying in, but not to rescue us. After our efforts amount to getting a friendly ship to crash into us, Hammond decides to pull the plug on our mission. His sentiment essentially comes to F this place, and while I could hardly agree more, he finds us a potential escape ship we can use to get out of here. We just need to board the ship that just crashed into us, the USM Valor, to get a singularity core to power it. I feel a bit like we're a vulture, coldly picking apart the remains of fallen comrades. But in Isaac's place, I wouldn't be moralizing either. We board a tram and head off to our objective. Hammond tells us that he thinks something fishy is going on. The USM Valor's presence doesn't feel like a coincidence. Their ship has a lot of weapon systems aboard. He thinks they're on a search and destroy mission. However, his video feed cuts out and Daniels can't reach him. We trudge onto another zero-g area. This time, we have to throw radiation balls into space while fighting off some space scorpions. You know, I think the Lakers might give me a look this year. With the spicy Cracker Jacks jettisoned into space, we're clear to open the airlock. We come to a storage area and have to shift around some storage containers to get through. Something's lurking. In dead space, I don't like when things lurk. Soon enough, we're introduced to a new enemy type, Twitchers. I hate, hate, hate these guys. They're far and away the scariest enemies in the game. It's not even close. Every time I think about these guys, I can feel another 30 seconds take off of my life just from the sheer stress. They move ridiculously fast, hurtling towards you like a running back that just discovered crack. And the worst part comes after you dismember them. Look at them just scuttle on the floor, just as fast too. Ugh. They have low health, meaning that even a couple of shots from the weak assault rifle is enough to send them down. So they're balanced at least. I mean, after saying all that, I suppose they're a really well-designed enemy, one you love to hate, but I don't know if I really love them. They just give me the jeebies, what can I say? When we board a cargo lift, we get a call from Terence Keynes, the chief science officer on the USG Ishimura. He tells us that we shouldn't leave quite yet. If we don't return the Maker, the space artifact, to its original place, we're dooming all of humanity. The planet won't stop unless we return the Maker. He asks for our help. Since the idea of trusting this guy doesn't strike Isaac as peachy keen, we pass him down on the offer, and instead continue trying to get the hell out of here. We continue on and face a massive combat area in this big hallway. Even though the hallway is wide, and long, this battle is far less about positioning and far more about accuracy. You see, we have to face more twitchers, and they're not about to let you run away. So I decided the best strategy is to stand ground, and let mints become meat. After the battle, we arrive in this turbine area. Now, I don't like this area at all. You have to push these two turbines across the floor and shoot out power fuses along the way as fire periodically sprays at you. Sounds simple, right? Yeah, except it wasn't. Pushing the furnaces forward was easy, but after you push one furnace to the end, you have to pull it back to go around to the other one and blow its fuses. The furnaces don't like to go backwards, at least not on the gamepad I was using. Pulling them back with an analog stick was painful. To actually pull the furnace backwards, you have to go far enough back that you enter the zone of danger, a zone that is not clearly expressed. I would get torched, decide I didn't want to continue with such low health and waste a med pack, and I would start over from the beginning, and over, and over. Finally, I resolved to go to the side of the furnace to pull it sideways instead of going in front of it and pulling it directly back. 
I could pull this furnace sideways a lot easier. However, this also put me in danger of getting torched, by the way, so I'd have to jump out, pull it back, then duck behind the furnace as the flames burst out. I did it eventually, but this part honestly took me longer than any other part in the game. It wasn't challenging enough to warrant me getting stuck for so long. Unfortunately, it was just clunky. After clearing it though, we finally get our singularity core. Hammond meets us, and he's ready to get out of here. Unfortunately, he and Isaac are separated by a glass window. In Dead Space, you never want to be separated from Isaac by a glass window. A mutated rhino comes in, and Hammond has to kiss his Cabo plans goodbye. This death scene is brutal, even for a game like Dead Space. Man, this was rough. The rhino tries to make us his next happy meal, but we have other plans. Taking him out is pretty straightforward, no different than the other rhinos found throughout the game. With him taken care of, we're free to make to our exit, albeit with one of our musketeers thoroughly musketed. At least we've still got Daniels. She's a dependable woman. Trustworthy for sure. Definitely not someone who would betray us. Not at all. Daniels tells us that she's found the shuttle. Great news. Well, our pudding curdles pretty quick because Daniels lets us know the navigation cards are missing. Somebody scattered them around the deck. Without them, the ship's as good as useless. We've got to get a key card to get access to the deck, so we should pick that up first. We arrive in this hub area filled with candles and dead people. The candles are a weird sight in a sci-fi game with such an industrial look to everything. This strange setting starts to make more sense when examining the logs throughout the area. There's a lot of stuff in here about the Unitarians, the religious group we've encountered on the ship. The lore is some interesting stuff. The religion started as a cult of personality, centered around a guy named Michael Altman. He claimed that the government was covering up the existence of aliens from humans. The existence, he claimed, was proven by a mysterious artifact known as the Maker, the very same alien artifact that we've been hearing about throughout the game. His death under suspicious circumstances afterwards only progressed the religion further. The Unitologists believe that the Maker is the pathway to heaven, but that ascension requires death first. With the background about Unitology in mind, Dr. Chalice Mercer's actions and behavior makes a whole lot more sense. Again, it's some pretty interesting stuff, and it makes me wish even more that the main representative of Unitology in the game was presented a little bit more tactfully than through a hammed up, cliche sounding villain. Again, it's not so much a big criticism as much as a missed opportunity in my eyes. With our reading done, we head deeper into the ship. Along the way, we get another call from Terence Keynes, the suspicious sounding science guy. He lets us know that he really wants to meet with us. I still don't trust this guy as far as I can throw him, but I guess the next option is to become snuggle buddies with the necromorphs. No thanks. Daniels hops on the call and tells us that the life support system is down in space lock B. We've got to turn it back on. I'm getting the sense that Daniels is a little bit more of a delegator than a doer. She learned that from Hammond, I guess. The zero-g battle we run up against is pretty hard actually. I go through a lot of ammunition and run dangerously close to running out of air too. After a bit more fighting, we find the access card we've been looking for. It's in the middle of a z-ball court. Again, I like how the game uses environmental storytelling to tell us more about the ship and the lives of the people that used to live on it. The ship design is amazing from a video game perspective, but at times it looks so downright depressing with its cold hallways and corridors that you wonder how anyone could avoid going insane living inside of it. Day in, day out. It's nice to see that the crewmates had some fun every once in a while at least. We make our way back, and run into a little surprise along the way. I appreciate how Dead Space doesn't overdo the jump scares. By using them sparingly, they always seem to hit when I least expect it. Another thing I learned is that shops are not always safe zones. Once the necromorphs decide to take their business elsewhere, I get Isaac decked out in his final armor. Dr. Mercer soon graces us with his presence, with a pre-recording of him talking to Unitologist. He's chastising them for not having enough faith, and he's really earning his gold star marks on his zealotry. This part underscores what I've talked about earlier. He's just such a villain. And I think it would have been cool to see a fanatical Unitologist that tones it down just a little bit. I'm not asking for a lot, just like an 8 rather than an 11 on the diabolical scale. A puzzle awaits us in the next room, and by puzzle I mean more of a jigsaw puzzle than a brain buster. There are a bunch of bunks scattered around the area where you have to use Isaac's stasis module to shift them around and create a path forward. On the way there, it's simple enough. Once we're through the bunks, we come across a lady who's doing her best interpretation of a grasshopper. <laughs> she swiftly unalives herself, and we politely step past her to grab our nav card. With the nav card in hand, we have to head back. Remember moving those bunks around? Yeah, prepare to do it under what I'd call a high stress situation. Dr. Mercer's twisted and invincible creation, the Hunter, tag teams with an augmented necromorph. To hunt you down as you have to make your way back through the bunks, this may have been the most anxiety inducing part of the game for me. Having an invincible enemy hunt you down as you have to meticulously shift around bunks to forge yourself a path is 10 notches past stressful. 
Once we're through, the party's not quite over yet. We have to wait for an elevator, dipping, diving, dodging, and ducking around the room, popping off necromorphs as the invincible hunter, well, hunts you. The latter half of chapter 10 sure packs on the tension and anxiety. After powering through, we return to the hub area of this level. There's creepy singing in the background now. I'm definitely not adding it to my Spotify playlist, let's say that. We ascend the elevator, and we get an in-person meeting with Keynes. He lets us know what they have found on the planet's surface was the hive mind. The marker was keeping it contained. When they dislodge the marker, they release the hive mind. The hive mind controls all of the necromorphs telepathically. He tells us that the escape shuttle won't do us any good, because the shock point drive is destroyed. Our best, and our only chance is to return the maker on the planet's surface and contain the hive mind. We forge ahead and repair the shuttle so Keens can take it to the flight deck where the maker is being held. After fighting through the executive suite, which feels far less executive with these bloated necromorphs stomping around, we arrive at the shuttle. Our beloved hunter makes an appearance. Again, we need to find a way of dealing with him past taking pot shots with our plasma cutter. You have to lead him to the deck area, blast him with stasis, and turn the jet engines on. This was a good encounter. Dealing with him is straightforward enough, but you have to contend with other necromorphs during the process, which complicates the engagement and keeps you on your toes. Keens boards the ship, telling us to meet him at the flight deck. Daniels warns us that she's uneasy about him, which I certainly agree with, but she says it's best that we work with him for now. We're presented with one final video before the end of the chapter. Dr. Mercer, our terrorizer, our antagonizer throughout the game. As a zealous Unitarian, he believes death is the only way to ascension. So, he presents himself to a necromorph and lets his face become a dinner platter. It could be seen as a bit anticlimactic that such a thorn in our side meets his end in a video com rather than an in-person interaction with Isaac. At the same time, the cutscene represents the logical conclusion of Dr. Mercer's beliefs, rather than him facing some utterly shocking fate. As such, the more subdued end here feels fitting. At the bottom of our elevator ride, we find the body of Dr. Mercer being transformed by the necromorph. In the end, he reached some form of transformation, I suppose, although it feels like the furthest thing from ascension. We board the tram and head off to meet Keynes. Keynes orders us to go to the cargo bay and get the maker. Then, we'll bring it to him and eventually return it to the home planet. Everything he's said so far has made sense, and he's even shown us some video evidence of his claims. Yeah, I still can't bring myself to trust this guy. He just sounds so darn sinister. Either way, we're still knee deep in this creek. Might as well keep wading through it. After a quick stop at the shop, picking up our baguettes, lettuce, and flamer fuel, we head down to the cargo bay. We activate a lift, and the maker ascends to our view. It looks alien, I'll give it that. Yet, it still somehow maintains an industrial look, even for something so alien. Like its creators had laser carved the grooves and engravings in a slightly more high-tech factory than the steely human ships. Overall, it's a good mix of foreign, mysterious looks with the industrial sensibilities of Dead Space. I wonder how many times I've said industrial in this script. As I hope you've learned to expect by now, trouble soon follows after we've found the Maker. Mechamorphs come in droves to play keep away from us and the Maker. This is one of the hardest combat encounters in the game, and this comes down to a few factors. First, the area just throws a lot of necromorphs at you. You get the whole Skittles rainbow of necromorphs here, from the slow bloaters to the fast enhanced necromorphs, even to the tripod little blasters that like to take pot shots from a distance. Next, although the area is big, the navigable area is small. You're confined to thin bridges that connect the corner rooms. It's easy to get pinned between gangs of approaching necromorphs and not have space to duck past. Lastly, some tentacles of the like we saw from the Leviathan boss fight also joined the party. They thrash about the center area, slapping you like an overeager pancake on the griddle if you venture too close. This makes certain bridges off limits until you deal with them, which is hard to do when there are 20 necromorphs vying for VIP access to tear you in two. Eventually we power through with our weapons. Now we need to meet Keens at the hangar bay. As far as difficult combat encounters go for this chapter, we're not out of the woods yet. The room we enter shuts down into quarantine state. I think a good litmus test for the difficulty of a fight in dead space is whether I actually remember that stasis is an ability that I can use in combat, and then whether I actually use it in the fight. In this one, I certainly do both. After a hard-won battle, we reach the cargo bay, and Keens flies in. Next, we have to get the maker under Keens' ship and load it. The zero-gravity section here isn't very difficult, which breaks the pattern we've seen so far in this mission. The zero-g part doesn't really feel all that useful here. You're pretty much confined to a single plane of movement, and you aren't going to be ping-ponging around as you're hauling the maker. We deal with more of the ranged necromorphs, which aren't difficult to dispatch, but they can be a bit annoying when they snipe you from afar. If you don't want to see your health plummet, you've got to take a break dragging the maker and deal with them. They're more of a deterrent than a challenge though. After loading the maker, I was half expecting Keens to jet off into the sunset, leaving us high and dry. But he actually sticks around. He video comms us, telling Isaac to join him aboard and put an end to this necromorph madness. I still have a bad feeling about this guy. A minute later though, I realized I'd been completely wrong about him. 
You see, Keynes is on the straight and narrow, early straight shooter kind of guy. There's a betrayer though, it turns out, punctuated by a bullet through Keen's chest. Jeez, to find out you're so wrong about a guy. Makes sense why I'm here making videos on YouTube, rather than chasing a calling in HR. Turns out, Daniels isn't on Team Isaac. In fact, she's been a fly in our proverbial butter this whole time. She's on a covert mission to recover the Maker for her benefactors. She's working for the government. The Maker is in fact man-made, reverse engineered by true alien artifacts centuries ago. This is all one big experiment to them. Humans brought the Maker to the planet and turned it on. The planet was sealed off, until a mining company decided to show up and crack the planet open for materials. Talk about a whoopsie. Daniels finishes by telling us that Isaac did a great job, pouring a whole packet of salt on the whole thing. I don't know. For me, this whole betrayal fell a bit flat. Sure, I wasn't expecting it, but at the same time, I feel like the best reveals feel like a veil being torn from your eyes. You suddenly see the whole picture. Instantly, you see how the pieces fit together, how all the little hints and foreshadowing throughout come together, but you just didn't see it until now. With Daniels, my reaction was more of a, what? I don't know. It just kind of felt so far out of left field. It was hard for me to see how her actions throughout have pointed her towards gunning towards the second objective. She seemed too panicky and argumentative before to be this smooth covert operator. Like I remember her in earlier chapters, when she was so mad at Hammond and accusing him for mooring more than he did. Sure, that was all part of her act, being a covert operator and all. But I don't know. I guess it just didn't feel that earned to me. Maybe some dead space expert is going to come across this video and let me know how I've missed all the little details that pointed so clearly to her being this rogue operator. Even so, I'd still be left with that underwhelming feeling I had at the reveal. At Isaac's darkest moment, his dawn arrives. We meet up with Nicole. She lets us know that we can actually recall the ship and pilot ourselves to the planet's surface. What welcome news. With a press of a button, we emergency recall the ship, boomeranging Daniels back to port. <laughs> she sure didn't think of that one. She bounces out in an escape pod before the ship gets back though, so we don't encounter her. We board the ship with Nicole, along with the Maker in tow. Now it's time to get back down to the planet's surface. We've got a gift to return, and we have the receipt. We're on the planet's surface, ready to deliver the Maker, and end the necromorph threat once and for all. The chapter starts off a bit weird. When it begins, you're just abruptly standing on the surface of the planet. There's no intro cutscene of you landing with Nicole or anything like that. You're just standing on the surface all by yourself with Nicole out of sight. It's a bit jarring to be honest. We find her pretty quick though. She's on the landing bay. We have to help her unload the maker. I find it kind of funny how Isaac's all decked out in the level 5 rig armor and she's just wearing a glorified jumpsuit with no protection. By the end of the chapter, her get up makes sense, but it's still a bit funny. We get the maker loaded up and prepare to dive deeper into the facility. Beforehand, I load up on ammunition. Because this is the final chapter, I don't see any need to save it. These kiosks don't seem to let me invest in crypto, unfortunately. The next section of the chapter consists of dragging the marker throughout the facility, deeper into the necromorph nest, fighting off the hordes of necromorphs that the game throws in our face. And the game sure throws necromorphs at us. The thing is, the challenge doesn't feel as oppressive as other combat encounters in the game. The reason why is this section is so liberal with the ammunition. No matter how many bullets I went through, I was still loaded foot to ass for this entire chapter, nearly maxing out my inventory space on firepower. It was a nice change of pace actually, to be able to just let loose and cut through the opposition without feeling like I have to hold back. It's very fitting for the final chapter of a game. You're throwing everything you have at the enemy, while the enemy is doing the same to you. In addition, the chapter ties together narrative and gameplay really well. I like how the game makes you drag the maker throughout the facility with your kinesis module, rather than have it coast by on a conveyor belt or something like that. By actually having to drag the hunk of metal yourself and put labor into it, you're more invested in getting this thing to its location. I mean, after dragging it 90% there, you want to get through the next 10% just as a matter of principle. Meanwhile, you're delving deeper into the necromorph nest, gameplay-wise as well as story-wise. It all lines up well. Eventually, we get through the whole facility and go outside. After spending so much time cramped in a spaceship, it's really refreshing to go out and see the sun, even if this is a hostile planet sun. We drag the Maker through the final leg of its journey, fighting another heavy wave of necromorphs. Isaac has so many health packs and ammo at this point that the encounter doesn't rank as one of the most difficult, but the enemy's strength still makes the whole thing feel climactic and intense. We get the marker in place and commence locking this puppy up. Then, in the brightness, Nicole walks out. I'm getting the feeling that she's not exactly the human she appears as. She keeps saying we are whole again, which, come to think of it, is one of the creepiest things someone can say. I mean, there are about zero acceptable circumstances in which someone can utter that and not be insane. Never mind that now. We need to make our way out of here. We enter a decontamination chamber, and promptly a recording of Nicole plays. It's not just any recording, though. Remember the recording at the very beginning of the game? Yeah, I guess there's a little more to the tape. And it's a bit of important info. 
you see, because at the very end, Nicole poisons herself. Yeah, she's been dead this entire time. Everything Isaac's seen of her since the recording has been hallucinations, likely worsened by the maker. In fact, the first letter of every chapter in the game spells out Nicole is dead. Yes, that is very cool. No, I did not discover that myself. I can thank the wiki for that. But I don't know, this twist kind of fell flat for me too. True, the game did foreshadow it. I mean, she was kind of acting like a weirdo this whole time, and she popped up in some really odd places. So it didn't come out of left field, and it did explain some of her behavior. The thing is though, I had another reaction to confusion because I had some questions. Isaac had this tape for the whole game. Daniels implied that Isaac had watched it multiple times, yet this was all a surprise to him. So did he just not watch the whole thing? Daniels speaks to the intercom shortly after. She says that Isaac is insane and confirms that Nicole has been dead the whole time. So, it seems she's known about this for a while. It seems most likely that Isaac didn't have access to the whole tape. Daniels was a rogue element after all. It seems she only gave him part of the tape. But for what end? I mean to keep him on the mission I guess. So what? She knew that Nicole was dead and that Isaac was hallucinating about it, yet still trusted him to have the capability to perform various tasks? I don't know, it all just feels a little flimsy to me. And also, there's that part in the game where Nicole is unlocking a door for you, while you protect her from necromorphs. If she is a hallucination, who is opening that door? What were the necromorphs attacking exactly? It could be some random shipmate I guess. I don't know. Each question is small but all of them in conjunction, it just didn't do it for me. Maybe everything really does dovetail together, and I just miss parts of the story. Still, I don't feel like I should have to do research like a college research paper just to piece together how any of this makes sense. Anyway, we've still got to get off this planet. Surprise surprise, we run into Daniels on our way out. Turns out, it's a very short reunion because a hive mind appears and isn't too happy about our gift return. It takes out some frustration on Daniels, serving as a spindly necromorph version of Karma. She takes a permanent dirt nap. We're left to face the hive mind on our own. I thoroughly enjoyed this boss fight. I'm always skeptical of final boss fights in games that aren't really built for them. Dead Space only really has three boss fights after all. When games not built for boss fights try to really make their final bosses tough, they often end up frustrating because the game's mechanics aren't really meant for that specific type of challenge. Dead Space doesn't fall into this category because the final boss is easy, there really isn't any challenge to it. Essentially, you just have to run back and forth and shoot at the weak yellow points. As I said, not exactly challenging. Dodging the tentacles doesn't really take much more than holding onto the run button, and you're so well stocked on ammo that you can just blast away. So, if the game mechanics aren't exactly riveting, why did I enjoy this boss fight so much? It's because it leans really heavily into spectacle. And this worked for me. The hive mind is massive and epic feeling, and the arena you fight in is really cool with the dying sunlight cast behind the beast. It's epic and theatrical. I mean, look what happens when the monster picks you up by the foot. You dangle in the air, upside down, having to shoot at the giant monster with a fiery backdrop and debris crashing down onto the planet. I could see some people taking issue with this boss fight because the tone and feel contrast so heavily with the rest of the game. This fight is bombastic, while the rest of the game's tone is subdued, measured, and eerie. For me though, this contrast is exactly why this fight is so memorable. It stands out so much from the rest of the game, and it feels like a truly unique experience. Which, in the closing of a 10 hour game, is something that I appreciate. With the hive mind turned into the hive nevermind, cast down to the depths of this hellish place, we can call Isaac's journey complete. Or at least, we think. Isaac's girlfriend jumps for our throat, and the game ends. And now I'll get into some closing thoughts. Dead Space is a certified classic, its art direction and its dedication to immersion stand the test of time. The gameplay is pitch perfect, threading the line between a high paced action game and the slower sensibilities of more survival grounded games. Ammunition is balanced to the point that you're always aware of it, but you aren't really ever running out. You always have that one last bullet, that one last drop of fuel in your flamer, to take down the final necromorph scraggling your way. As mentioned numerous times, the dedication to immersion is second to none. The game really elevates itself to stand as an immersive experience. You're transported to this dark barren ship, and this ability to submerge yourself in the game world heightens everything. The fights feel more intense. The fright hits harder. The hints of relief, of hope shine even brighter. The weakest part of the game in my opinion was the A-plot, the direct plot motivating Isaac and the cast of characters around him. None of the main characters were too interesting, and the plot sometimes felt more like an excuse to get you to plunge deeper into the ship, rather than being a narrative hook that sinks into you. Although this is the game's weakest part, I don't really see it as much of a detriment to the game as a whole. The beautiful part about games is that they don't always need a strong A-plot. You're a space engineer with a plasma cutter, clawing your way to survival step by step. And if the game makes you believe in that fantasy, if it immerses you in that role, that's more than enough. 
Dead Space gives you a tightly trimmed experience that can't be described as anything but memorable. The finer plot points might fade, because they're not all that important, but you'll remember what it's like the first time you came across a Twitcher or Hunter or Rhino. You'll remember the tension when you creep through the Ishimura's corridors, expecting danger at every turn. You'll remember the hive mind, capping off the adventure. As I say these final words, I'm again astounded at how this series has escaped me for so long. It's worth the hype, and it's worth the time. I look forward to spending even more time in this world with the sequel, Dead Space 2. Hey, thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you've made it this far, I'm beyond humbled. This is my first crack at making a long video like this. Or making a video, really, if I'm being honest. I love spreading my passions and the happiness it brings to others. In this world, I feel like that adding some positivity to someone's life, even if it's just a YouTube video, is worth it. Another big passion of mine is writing. My mission is to create character-focused stories, plots that keep you engaged, centered around people that you care about. The first novel in my Northfield saga, Apocalypse Bounty, follows the life of Mark Northfield, a lone mercenary operating in the post-apocalypse. His only comfort is the memory of his dead wife, and he lives by two final promises to her. Never let go of life, and never let the world turn him into someone worse than the man she married. When a vengeful adversary blackmails Northfield into assassination mission, his hope of keeping both vows shatters. If he refuses to complete the mission, he faces execution. He must either accept his death or corrupt himself. More lies in his decision than the state of his soul. Unknown to him, his target holds the key to saving the world. Self-promotion is about as fun to me as flossing my teeth with a steak knife, so I wouldn't do it unless it was a story I truly believed in telling, and something I think you'd find a lot of joy and meaning in. So, if you're so gracious, please check out the Northfield Saga on my website, calvinfishermedia.com. You can also find it via Amazon. With all that said, thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for watching this video. If you want to see more, please like and subscribe. This is just the beginning. With that, I'm signing off. Have a great day.